we as a people must not allow our leaders to be marginalized or get to the place where we don't want to hear from those who have spoken words of encouragement and words of freedom and liberation to many who have no voices. He stands as a conscience of America, provoking America to do what is right, to stay on the course. And without him and many others like him, we would not have the freedoms we have today. So I hope that you will stand on your feet and encourage one of our great leaders, the Reverend Al Sharpton, here in the great city of Portsmouth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first to uh, our pastor and uh, certainly, isn't this a beautiful church, Reverend Marinda and Grove. And to uh, Miss White, Sister White and the Urban League and to all of you, the elected officials, the members of the clergy, and then to all of you that have come out tonight, I'm very happy and honored to be here and to be a part of this gathering. And at a crucial time, uh, when, when I heard about the call for Act Now, that is exactly what we need to be talking about. There is a problem around the country where many of us suffer what I call Negro amnesia. <laughs> that is where we have forgotten where we come from. When you forget where you come from, you don't know where you are. And you clearly won't know where to go. There are some that act as though they arrive where they are by themselves. So I, I was talking to Sister White, and uh, we talked about the Urban League and Nash Action Network, the group I lead, works very closely with the, the National Urban League. Mark Morial is national president. I talked just this morning. I'm speaking next week at their national convention, so is the president. And she was saying part of what she was doing is letting people understand the need to work with the Urban League, and it's almost to me indicative of this problem that people have to convince us to work for ourselves <laughs> with groups that are responsible for where we are. That doesn't even really make sense. And when you get some of us that have benefited better than the others, you should be the first ones involved. You know, you meet these that tell you, well, I got there because of my skills, or I got there because of my pedigree, or my education. First of all, you're not the first smart Negro in America. been smart a long time. You were able to take your smartness where others couldn't because people like the Urban League fought to open doors for you. Let's not ever forget that blacks who 
you ready to play baseball before Jackie Robinson? We just couldn't play. Blacks were ready to be president before Obama. America just wasn't ready. So don't get in your high polluting place and forget that it was some people that didn't have degrees, that didn't have the pedigree, that didn't have the background, but they went to the streets and sponsored you the way you are.
everybody that is black ain't necessarily for me. Everybody that's my color ain't my kind. I want to know what you going to do. I'm tired of electing just blacks and they get there and forgot what we elected them for. We didn't send you down there to be a big shot. We sent you down there to represent us. The thing to get me uh, mad, Reverend, is they get in some of our elected, some of our corporate leaders, and some of our preachers. <laughs> and we get them in position. And they start modifying and moderating and taking shortcuts. And I said, well, what happened to you? What's wrong with you? Well, it's a new strategy. <laughs> well, what is the strategy? Well, you got to go along to get along. <laughs> no, if you scared, say you scared. <laughs> something we ain't figured out. <laughs> Just say I'm scared and sit down and shut up and let somebody not scared stand up and do what got to be done. <laughs> we talk about civil rights movement back in the day. We need a movement now. <laughs> Today, our schools are worse same city, same school system, yet they can't teach reading on outside of town, but they can teach it in the other side. Four grades behind in reading, five grades behind in mathematics, yet we pay the same tax, but don't get the same education. We've got work to do today. For favors, we're asking for what we're supposed to have. Yeah. Then when they talk about the country's broke, who broke it? <laughs> How you gonna tell us that got the least, that we got to give the most? Reagan came in, he had a trickle-down economic theory, give a tax cut to the rich, said it would trickle down to the rest of us, that was 1980, it's 2012. We got the down and never got the trick. just about Obama, it's about your mama. Thurgood Marshall, 
Adam Creighton Powell, Malcolm X, they all changed this country with a mammograph machine and a rotary phone. Here you are in the 21st century with all this technology, laptop all over your house, Blackberry in one pocket, two cell phones in the other, Facebook, Twitter, got 50 different ways to communicate and can't get five people together to do nothing. in this country. That's what Urban League's about. That's why you must be involved. But let me tell you something else. We've got to also deal with the internal problems in our own community. We have the issues of what others do to us. But then we've got the issues of what we are doing to each other. The self destruction does internal fratricide and suicide in our community while young people are growing up feeling that blackness is about being a thug and a hood if you study our history from slavery we always aspired to be learned and educated what did they do in slavery they made it against the law for us to read and write and if whites were caught teaching us, they were punished. So we always aspired to be more and learn it. When we got out of slavery and reconstruction, when we couldn't go to white Ivy League schools, we built our own historic black college. We built Hampton, we built Tuskegee all the way through into 54, first major civil rights victory, Brown versus the Board of Education, all the way into the 21st century. Now we get here, and we're going to decide we don't want to be educated no more. We're going to be hoodlums and thugs. Our two daughters in their 20s, their generation is told if you speak eloquent, if you're well read, if you act refined, you act in white. So then what is blackness? To act like a hoodlum? To be inarticulate and dumb? We cannot let this generation turn around what the definition of blackness is. I talk about it, and some of my friends is in hip hop. I talk about it everywhere I go. And all hip hop ain't bad, but some of this stuff has to be challenged. I mean, we came out a few years ago and said we have to bury the N word. Some of my friends got mad. You can't bury the N word. I said it's bad, we've all used it, but it gives a wrong self definition, it's a wrong self image. We cannot let our children grow up thinking that they are nothing. Because once you adjust to being nothing, people can do anything to you because you accept that you're nothing in the first place. No, well, Reverend, I don't care what you say. We got free speech. I said, no, you don't. 
What do you mean we don't? I said, if you go in a studio, I want y'all to think about this. If you go in a studio and you cut any CD that offends anybody but us, they won't put it out. If you cut a CD against the Irish, it's hate speech. They won't put it out and they should. You make a, a CD against Italians, hate speech. Won't put it out and they should. Make it against Jews, hate speech. Won't put it out. Gays, hate speech. Won't put it out and they should. So let me get that this right. Anti-Irish, hate speech. Anti-Italian, hate speech. Anti-Jewish, hate speech. Anti-gay, hate speech. Call blacks niggas, free speech. That's it. Nigga, 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 nigga. And I kept trying to reason with him. I said, brother, We've all used it, but we need to stop doing that. We got to build pride. We have to build a self-image. No, nah, nigga, nigga, nigga. <laughs> so we went about two hours. Finally, I gave up. He gave up. We parted our ways. I was on the road about a week later. I picked up the paper, and he'd been arrested in some altercation, some fight or something. I read the article. Kept going. About three days later, they called me from Nash Action Network headquarters, said he was on the phone, wanted to talk to me. <laughs> I said, all right. Plugged him through to my cell phone. They plugged him through. I said, how you doing? He, man, I ain't doing too good. I said, yeah, I heard you had a problem. Yeah, man, I got busted. I said, well, what'd they do? He said, yeah, they busted me. I said, yeah, well, let me know whatever I can do to help you out. Now, he said, I need your help. <laughs> I said, you need my help? Yeah, I need your help. I said, well, what you need me to do? He said, they violated my civil rights. <laughs> I told them, niggas ain't got no civil rights. say this. We all should leave here. Not talking about the community gathered, packed house, act now. You ought to leave here making a personal inventory on yourself. <laughs> on what are you going to do to act now? We are great at what everybody else does. This guy ain't that, this leader ain't that. What about you? <laughs> Pastor Man, I'll tell you, the hardest job, I'm gonna let out a trade secret. Hardest job for a black preacher is to preach the funeral of an irrelevant Negro. <laughs> That's a hard job. Preachers don't like to tell you that, but I'm going to tell you. <laughs> they roll the body down the middle aisle, <laughs> lay it out here in front of the altar. Family be up on the front row crying and carrying on. And we supposed to get up here and hallucinate a life for you you never did. shouldn't even have a funeral. Most folks should go straight from the mall to the cemetery. Because you ain't done nothing nobody can say nothing about. You know, I did Michael Jackson's funeral. I did his memorial service and did the eulogy at his burial. i never forget that night. He was coming out the cemetery. A very well-known artist. If I call his name, you'd all know him. He stopped me. He said, Rear Mal? I said, yes. He said, you really moved me with that eulogy. I said, well, thank you. No, 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 you really touched me. I said, well, thank you. He said, if I go first, I want you to preach a eulogy like that for me. 
I told him, well, you're going to have to give me something to work with. <laughs> you should ask yourself every day, if this is my last day, if I don't see tomorrow, what can they say about me? What has my life meant? What purpose have I served? What have I done that mattered the more than me? If all you live is get you a nice house, a nice car, that won't matter two minutes after you go. We'll sell your house and we'll ride all over Virginia in your car. The only thing that will matter is if some child could say you taught them something. If some community group could say you made a difference. And if you are here tonight and ask yourself, what am I doing? If you're not satisfied with your own answer, then you need to leave here tonight determined to work with us to make a difference on these issues in our community. Not for the Urban League, but for you. So that you have some value and some meaning in your life. Now a lot of people say, well, Reverend Al, you don't understand. I, I ain't got the abilities of this guy. It doesn't matter. Everybody has something. God gave everybody some unique gift that they can do. You may not be able to do what I do, but I can't do what you do. You find your niche and you work out your own soul salvation. And don't let nobody tell you what you can't do. The reason you don't believe it is because you don't have what our ancestors had. And that is they stretched out the thing that we're missing, and I'll close on this thing that we're missing is we have allowed others to set our limitations. I told President Obama, I love this book, The Audacity of Hope. We got it from one of Reverend Wright's sermons. But the fact is that we made it as a hopeful people. All my life, I believed in hope. But the older I get, Reverend, the more I live to see some things can happen where your hopes will be dashed. There's areas and there's situations that hope will run out. But I'm glad, as Reverend Seven is introducing me, I'm glad my mother raised me in the church because there's another gear in my spiritual transmission that when hope runs out, I can go to faith because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Faith is when the doctors give up, but you hold on for another doctor. Faith is when you got a pile of bills and no money. But you say he will provide all of my needs. Faith is when your friends walk down. When your loved ones don't know your name. When your family turned it back. But you say, I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me now. We come this far by faith.
On behalf of the Urban League of Hampton Roads, our board of directors, our staff, our guild, and our volunteers, to present this token of appreciation to you, Reverend Sharpton, for coming. You know, last week when you received the BET Humanitarian Award, you said, <laughs> you said, call me the ambulance because I'll come where needed. Where you came tonight, you delivered, you stood, and you gave us a message that was strong, that was pertinent, and that was powerful. Thank you so much. My message is that I would hope that we could inspire people to become more active. Uh, I think that the election this year is critical. The uh, move to suppress the vote uh, has uh, been an impediment to that. Virginia is one of those states. Virginia is a swing state. And I wanted to encourage people to come out and vote and understand that even with these new laws, we've got to do what we've got to do to make sure people can come out. I wanted to also express to them we are facing many issues in and outside the community. We've got the problems with our economy. We have the problems in terms of the trickle-down economic uh, theories that are being perpetrated. We have problems in our schools, but we also have problems with crime and things that we're doing one to another. So if I could inspire anybody tonight to get active and involved, then I fulfill my purpose of coming. Exactly the, the, the paradox okay. is that we have the first time in the history of this country uh, a black president and a black attorney general, but we have this underpinning of crime and, and, and thuggism. So what, what I, I want to challenge them is that we cannot have this imbalance of such great achievements and such great decay at the bottom at the same time. And a lot of that is where we invest our resources and a lot of that is where we uh, try to define ourselves, our young people. Where if our young people grow up thinking that being a hoodlum and a thug is the definition of blackness, where are we going to get the next Obama from? Where are we going to get the next Eric Holder from? So we can't reach such a peak and ignore what's going on on the ground and saying that the soil to produce the future is being eroded and corrupted. Uh, we're here with the uh, new drilling guy. What is your take on... Uh, Candidate uh, Romney refusing to uh, release his uh, taxes. Uh, what do you think about that? I think that the issue is that Romney said himself that he's a job creator. Look at what I did at Bain Capital. So we start looking there. And when we look there, we find out he had foreign investments in Switzerland and Bermuda and the Cayman Islands. We find that he said he left in 99, but he was signed in as CEO to 2001. And there were companies bought that they were laying off workers. There was companies bought that they were outsourcing jobs. Now he's saying, well, don't look at Bay. Well, you were the one who told us to look at Bay. He could have told us to look at his four years as governor of Massachusetts. He didn't. Now, the tax release would show us what he did. How much money did you make with these foreign investments? Did you pay taxes? Or did you use them as a foreign tax haven to not have to pay? So the reason that the release of the taxes becomes important is that will define how he conducted business, what he did at Bain. And he told us to look at that to know what kind of president he would be. So be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Randy Singleton, New Journal Guy. Uh, on behalf of the New Journal Guy founder, Reverend, I want to thank you for coming uh, to Virginia today. And uh, in closing, do you have any final words you would like to say to the people of Hampton? I think that it is imperative that we are all actively involved, especially in this election year. We must vote, we must get our families out to vote, we must get the IDs straight, and we must get with our young people, not to condemn them, but to help turn them around. I think we should be working with the Urban League on these training programs and these things that we're building in the community. And I think that we ought to be reading and, and dealing with journals like y'all so that we understand the sober issues in our community and not just become inundated with entertainment. We know more about 
where a rapper is doing than we know what we're doing in our own homes. And I think that we've got to become more sober and serious about what we're doing. Thank you.